Let's talk about right-sizing your business with someone who's scaled up and then down a little bit. Listen to this episode. Welcome to another episode of the Wedding Business Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Berg. I'm a speaker, author, sales trainer, website reviewer, and I help businesses like yours sell more, profit more, and have more fun doing it. Enjoy this episode. Hi, it's Alan Berg. Welcome back to another episode of the Wedding Business Solutions Podcast. I am so honored to have my friend Rod McMahon on. Rod, how are you doing today? Doing great. We were talking about right sizing, you and I, because you've scaled your business. But let's let's step back for everybody. So first of all, tell everybody your business name, where you are. Sure thing. And that gets a little complicated. The business is straightforward. It's Maximum Music, and we're a, a wedding DJ service in Toronto. But... I haven't lived in Toronto since the year 2000. So I spent 20 years on the East Coast, living in rural Nova Scotia, raising my family. And then for the last two years, I've lived in Calgary, Alberta. So both of these are 2,000 kilometers away from where the business is. And, and that was something that you and I, when we did a Mastermind Day up in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, we did one and everybody else there was thinking, you know, you have to sit across the table from someone to make the sale. And you're sitting there with a little smile on your face in the corner going, uh, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't do that. So when, when was the last time you actually met a couple face to face? For a while in, you know, the earlier 2000s, I still had that mentality that you've got to meet with people. So mm -hmm. we kept an office, had a salesperson and an operations manager, and we still followed that bricks and mortar model. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, it just realized that it wasn't necessary. So there was a point where I pulled the plug and I started to rent the uh, storefront of our building out to another tenant and, and took everything to be remote as far as sales. But that was in like the late 2000s before it was cool to, to not go to an office. <laughs> and uh, so I, I felt like I was ahead of it. And when, when COVID kicked in, it just was no concern as far as virtual. You know, we had been virtual for over 10 years by that point. Right. And, and, the, and again, you're making the sale, you're having conversations with people, you're finding out what they want. So uh, let's give the, the quick history for you. You started out as a DJ and it was just you? It was just me. It was one of those high school things where a few buddies are using an older brother's equipment. Uh, everybody starts to go off to university and I decide to keep doing it. And, uh, you know, still following that traditional model in, in rural Canada. Nobody, nobody runs a full-time DJ service. So pursuing education, started working with uh, a high school dance company that did video dances all across Canada and did sales for them. And uh, they were moving their head office from Halifax, Nova Scotia to Toronto, Ontario. I went with them. And within the first year, my wedding business went past my salary. So it's, you know, 1994 and I'm like, all right, this is full time and uh, never looked back from that point. I guess the interesting thing is I haven't been an active DJ since the year 2000. So through the 90s, I was hustling to build the business, but then kind of stepped back to, to run it remotely and, uh, and focus on raising a family and that sort of thing. So yeah, I haven't been an active DJ for a very long time. Right, and at, at your peak, how many weddings were you, your company doing a year? We were into that. 700, 750 Ooh. weddings, you know, 15 okay. or 16 on a Saturday night, full-time, two full-time operations people, the van, the warehouse, the office, everybody was making money except me. <laughs> That's actually a common story with some of my other guests and people that I speak to is that you grow to a certain point where the gross looks really good but the net is worse than when you were smaller. So now you've brought that back down to how many weddings a year would you say you're, you're, you're on target to do and you're looking to do for next year? Uh, this year, we're, we pretty much got the number. So for 2022, we'll clock out with about 250 weddings. Mm -hmm. and, and with us, it, it's weddings. I mean, of those events, there might be 10 or 15 that are just those odd things that come through the door, but... Mm -hmm we decided to tailor and to focus the website and the marketing and everything to be wedding experts. 
in a, in a world where most DJs want everyone's business. Um, you know, we're corporate, we're AV, we're photo booths. Right. We just, you know, we don't do big light shows or big sound systems. It's very simple wedding music. Yeah, it's something I spoke about. I just came back from a speakers conference and speakers were always enamored with my niche because it's so narrow. And they said, you know, your, your niche is an, an inch wide and a mile deep. And what it allows you to do, this was a conscious decision of mine, like a conscious decision of yours. By, by focusing on that, you put the blinders on and say, yes, there's other business out there. I'm not concerned with it. And I get to grow my business instead of scattering all around. And just like you, occasionally somebody comes to me outside of the wedding and event industry says, could you help me with something? If I'm the right guy, yes. If I'm not the right guy, no, I, I'll have somebody for you there. And, uh, and your market, I'm oh, sorry, your, your yeah. market is international. You yes. are you are the person, you're the brand, you can travel. Right. Uh, with with wedding services, you tend to have to be local. And, and fortunately, being in Toronto, we need a very small percentage of the market. Right. Right, right. But, but again, what's, what's beautiful here for everybody listening is, is here is Rod not sitting in his market, running a business, not doing the production work, right? So think about this. If you're a photographer, if you're a florist, if you're, it's different if you're a venue, the venue is going to be in that particular area. Yes, you could run a venue from outside. You don't have to cook. Right? You don't have to set the tables and things like that. So for those of you that are thinking about your next step, your transition as you've been in the business for a while and saying, you know, because, uh, you know, Rod, there's some guys that are like, oh, I'm 40. I can't DJ. Like, um, hello. We know people in their 60s that are killing it out there. And the same for some of the other things. There is a business model like this where you don't have to be out there every Saturday night doing that and have a successful business. So when, when was that transition for you? When did you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to DJ anymore. That was the physical move to Nova Scotia. So okay. when you leave your, your market, so that's <laughs> 23 years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, and it's never looked back. And, and from a, a sales perspective, I find it very easy to always speak about how great their DJ is. So someone in our industry, and I, I don't want to misquote it, but they, they referred to the Diana Ross and the Supremes. Like there's the, the headliner, right. which is the guy who owns the DJ company or the lady who owns the DJ company. And then there's everybody else. Right. Whereas I can take a sales approach of I do what I do best, which is, you know, keeping the details organized and finding their songs and being their point of contact and the DJs get to do what they do best, which is rock the party. Because my perfect DJ is, you know, mid thirties to early fifties, technically a really good DJ, but someone who grew up and they got a mortgage and they got a career and they, they don't want to run a DJ company, but to get paid really well to go out on a Saturday mm -hmm. is a perfect side hustle for them. So I've become a great place for DJs to move into as they tire of the, the clubby scene. And, and also not wanting to do the advertising, the marketing. Uh, do, do many of your DJs have other jobs? All but two or three. Right. It's uh, amazing. I've got, a, I've got an at-home dad. So okay. Monday to Friday, he's looking after the kids. Friday night, Saturday night, he goes out and makes what he feels was the equivalent of a week's work. Right. So, uh, curious, any of your people teachers? I don't. And I've heard on other podcasts that <laughs> teachers make great DJs. I think the Canadian DJs get paid or teachers get paid a little better. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need the side hustle over there. I've heard that the American <laughs> model. And it's, um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a real diverse crowd and there's a, a good number of women. So mm -hmm. because we don't do a big production, we're just two speakers and a DJ controller. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very accessible. We've had great success with with a lot of female DJs, especially with the you know the size and weight of speakers coming down. Mm -hmm. um, the venues with in-house sound systems, it, it's been great. And so, if somebody wants lighting, you just refer it out to another company. We have very basic lighting, but okay. we don't we don't push those. I mean, again, you talk about you know unique selling positions and and differentiating and and. <laughs> I'll digress. Having been to your workshops and seen you speaking in, in Vegas, there's, there's always something different. So wherever you're at in your trajectory with your business, 
you can you can see a presentation and pull different nuggets out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've done that a few times with you where it's like, okay, what, what will be relevant this time? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I may have digressed and gone off topic. What was the right, question? So, again? Well, talking about, you know, you're, you're not doing the lighting, you're not doing the photo booths, you're not doing all those things. Um, you know, again, that's a conscious decision, right? And, and I take the approach because I'm doing all of our sales that what, what is best for you and what will give you as the couple the best outcome? You know, are people going to go to brunch with you on Sunday and say, that was the coolest light show and the deepest bass I ever heard. Too bad the DJ sucked. You know, like <laughs> said no one ever. So whereas most DJs want to bring someone into a showroom, upsell lighting and photo booths and interactive things, I'm telling couples that they don't need that. Okay. And, and it's amazing how many people that resonates with. But so, if they do want it, somebody they else go can do somewhere, it. Someone else, like, it, it tends to be a bit of a, a package. So when I talk about our ideal client and when I've done over the last 20 years projects to figure out who is our ideal client, where do they live? What do they do? What do they listen to? We have a lot of... Well, all of our clients don't want a entertainer. They don't want a DJ who's going to come out in front of the booth. You know, we may facilitate some announcements and and do some light master ceremonies duties, but we're not going to be taking over the evening. And and fortunately, that's counterintuitive to the message that most of the other DJs are giving a couple. So if, if a couple chooses to talk to three companies, they're going to have two that are talking about photo booths and emceeing and sound systems and gear. Right. And they're going to have me talking to them about DJ, who's a team player, who works with your officiant and your photographer and your caterer and keeps it smooth and makes sure that the maid of honor doesn't sneak out to the washroom just before her speech. And, and those things resonate with the couple and they start to truly see that we, we do understand weddings and we're not about the production and the show. And I, I think, you know, we, I know you like to give, you know, takeaways and, and give people different ways to look at things. I, I feel in the DJ industry and maybe in other parts of the wedding industry, there, there's too much focus on the stuff. Like, here's, look at my camera, look at my DJ speakers. <laughs> right. Uh, well, it's, it, it, it really, it's really the experience. I and mean, that's what you're talking about is the experience. But the other thing that you mentioned, again, if people miss this, you know, you're in a market, Toronto, which is a big market, and even 250 weddings a year, which is a lot of weddings, is a tiny fraction because I think it's the fourth largest city in North America. So the people that want something different, the people that want a big light show, the people that want to have, you know, two band teams, the people that want to have live musicians and all these other things, which you can have, if that's right for that couple, you're not the right fit. And that's okay. Because it is okay. Other. Right. And, it's okay. Yeah. And I did used to be that guy who wanted everything. So right. if it was an off night or a Friday or less hours, I would negotiate or mm-hmm. take a bit off the pricing. And and now, you know, and I don't mind sharing. We we charge 1975 Canadian mm-hmm. for a DJ with two speakers. Right. That's it. Right. And what is that? What is that like? Uh, Two hundred dollars U.S. these days? Is that's that about right. <laughs> yeah. that's about the equivalent. Yeah. But yeah. but that is, it's become a fair price. So often with couples, they'll say, "I'm in the middle." Okay. We called three people. There was one more expensive. There was one less expensive. So I, I'm not losing people on price. If if I lose someone, it's usually it has to do with we really wanted a photo booth, and the other company would include that. Right. So then, yeah, you know, that's fair. I, I take that. <laughs> right. And again, that, that's okay. Again, that's something you chose not to do. And that's important. Everybody listening here, you chose not to do that. It's like, I chose not to have anybody else on my team. If you're going to get someone to train, I just got off a call with someone. I'm going to do a, a remote training call for her team. She wanted me. She wasn't looking for somebody else. She wanted me. So, um, so it sounds like you charge the same price for all of your DJs, right? Yes. There's no one who's better or worse and they don't get their DJ assigned when they book. I do that about four months before the wedding. Okay. So, and, and you're explaining that up front to the couple. And it, it, how do you, let's say you have multiple DJs available. How do, you assi- how do you decide who gets it? 
it's not an exact science. It's for me, 35 years of gut feeling and trying to make good notes when I'm on a phone call with them okay. to, to suss it out. You know, we have multicultural weddings. I would say we've created a niche doing fusion weddings where if, if both bride and groom are Greek, they're going to get a Greek band and it's going to be a Greek wedding. Right. But when you've got a Greek bride and a Caribbean groom or, you know, a Greek bride and, you know, some sort of rural Canadian country music loving, they, they can't hire one niche. They have to right. find someone who can pull it all together, share time. So, so we've really created a niche in infusion weddings of okay. cultures and ages and, and people seem to like that. And can, Canada is quite the melting pot. So, and, and Toronto itself is quite the melting pot. Well, uh, it's so. not even a melting pot. I think, you know, again, the, the American model is you come in and you all melt and you become American. And in other countries, and I know Canada fits this, we don't want to, so, so they stay very Greek, Italian, Portuguese. Right. They've got their communities. They, they really keep their identity. So they don't melt here as much as maybe they do in other right. parts. Pro probably the wrong phrase. There's just a lot yeah. of different cultures. No, it is. Yeah. So I, I grew up in New York City in a county called Queens County, one of the five mm -hmm. boroughs in New York, which I heard is the most ethnically diverse county in the entire United States, that one county. Uh, and literally drive down the street and look at the signs on the stores and three blocks later, they're a different language and three blocks later, they're a different language. It, it's like that. So, uh, so how many different DJs do you have access to then? I would say my list is 20. And at the most, this point, we're doing eight weddings, which is almost uncomfortably too many. Um, but you so used to do how many? What was the high 15 point? 15 or 16. 15 or 16 on a Saturday night, you're doing half of that and you're almost uncomfortable with that now, uh, but you're profiting more than when you oh, were doing. Yes. Oh, oh yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, finally, I, I see, I see a retirement horizon. You know, right. did, 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 everybody, did everybody hear that? Everybody hear that? This is what right sizing is all about. It's not about just more, 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 more. It's about finding the, the sweet spot in your market, in your profit, where when we do X, we're profiting the way that we want to without the headache like you had there, Rod, with twice as many people out there. Um, I have a speaker friend, same thing. He reached this milestone, which let him get into a certain group. And when he was grossing half of that, he was profiting more. Yes. You know, he had bragging rights, but bragging rights don't send you to retirement. Bragging rights don't send you on holiday. <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, again, how many people in the DJ industry can – leave and go to Europe and East Africa for the entire month of July. Right, right. When, when talking... you're the only employee full-time in your business. So I was, I was working remotely for the entire month of July right. and everything came off without a hitch. It, you know, paying the, I, again, you know, to give some takeaways, if, if I could talk to 20 year old me, mm -hmm. <laughs> find a mentor, <laughs> Find people, go to the conventions, meet people, do training. Uh, don't get caught in that trap of bigger is better. Don't get into that trap of, you know, if you're going to have a storefront or something, own your business, the sooner, or own your building, the sooner you can own your building. Right. That's but but this, is, this is the business of weddings, not the doing weddings. And the people art of weddings. At, yeah. The yeah, art of people, weddings is the creative. Different. And people look in from the outside and every time, again, this speaker conference, I just came back from, you know, they say, oh, so you love doing weddings. I said, I've never done a wedding. I've never done a wedding. I don't want to do a wedding. That's not what I do. I want to help the people that love doing weddings to have a better business so they can profit more and retire and, you know, travel in East Africa for the month of July and, and, and do, whatever, do, do what you want. This is a business now. And another thing, tell your 20 year old self, you know, don't follow the next shiny object piece of equipment. Um, and there's some other podcasts I've done here where I've talked about a short story. Somebody called me and said, Hey, do you think I should buy two flat screen TVs? And I said, why? And he said, well, all my competitors have them. I said, that's the worst possible reason for having, for doing something. You know, don't price yourself based on your competitors. Don't buy what they have because it could be sitting on their shelves, you know, for all, you know, let's find a way to streamline it and streamline the profitability. And if you decide to increase your volume, each event is that much more profitable. And that's really the key is work on the profitability first then work on the volume. 
Uh, somebody called me one time up in Boston. They were doing 200 weddings a year, and they said they want to do 500. My first question is, why? <laughs> That's the first question is, why? Uh, somebody in Dallas, uh, I want to do 250 weddings, and there were just two guys in this company. And I said, why? And he said, well, I'll be seen as a bigger player in the market. I said, I want to feed your family, not your ego, right? So let's work on that part of it. All right, so a couple last things. We know what you would tell your 20-year-old self there, but um, how would you coach somebody, uh, give them some tips in terms of finding that right size, finding that sweet spot? Well, what should they be looking for? Uh, I applied profit first for the accounting and mm -hmm. some people will know other people might be surprised but if you go it's a, find it's a book, book profit it, first right mike mccallowitz is the author yes. definitely buy that book and he's been a dj um you know vegas presenter and stuff as well over the years uh, I, I started to apply that principle in 2018 2019 thank goodness i was applying it back then before covid kicked in right and and that really opened my eyes to my expenses column versus my owner's compensation. So my operating expenses. And so, you know, to pick just numbers out of the air, you know, if you have a $250,000 a year business and you can keep 150,000 of that, that's a darn good business. Yep. If you've got a million dollar business, but you've got trucks and people and gear and you know, you might only take home 75,000 and you're working more hours. Right. It's just mind boggling. Uh, I, I, I recommend figuring out what you need and then scale based on how you can pay yourself first. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't read that book, um, what Rod's talking about is different bank accounts. One of them is called profit. And I, I've mentioned this before. My wife said the refrigerator was going. And I said, which one do you want? And she pulled it up. And I said, hang on a second. I went to my phone, went to my bank app, looked at that account and said, go for it. Go for it. It's there. The money's there. October so, 1st, I, I just gave myself $2,500, which is half of what was in my profit account. In the profit account, right. And you leave some in there because that's part of that book. We're not going to spoil yeah. it for you. And Mike's got other books there. Mike McCallowitz, uh, The Pumpkin Plan and some other ones, yeah. which are also helpful there. But it, the, so the, the takeaways from this in terms of right sizing is it's easy to look and say, we need to be bigger, 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 bigger. But if you're not watching that bottom line, if you're not watching that profit, you're going to miss the fact that bigger sometimes isn't better because the bottom line is going to be worse. And uh, you've been there. I've been there, Rod. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on this. Um, and, and then the selling remotely. Again, he was ahead of the curve, folks. He was doing this decades before it was popular. Uh, you don't have to be face-to-face. -face. You just have to be able to have a conversation with someone. That's really what it comes down to. So, Rod, thank, to you so much. thank you so much for sharing this. I can't wait to see you when I'm up in Calgary uh, uh, next month. It's actually going to be next month now, which will be probably around the time this comes out, maybe before. I have to see when the timing of that is. But thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Wedding Business Solutions Podcast. If you liked it, please subscribe to this channel and post a review on your chosen platform, Apple Podcasts or whichever one. If you have any questions about anything in this episode or any of my episodes, email me directly at alan at weddingbusinesssolutions.com or visit my website, allenberg.com, A-L-A-N-B-E-R-G.com. If you have any suggestions for future topics or guests that you'd like to see, please again, email me or visit my website. Thanks for listening.